From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Once again, it's Friday. And you are here with the most important podcast on the internet. And we're happy that you're here with us. And we're here today with our friend Robert Santana. We're going to continue our discussion that we had previously about uh, diet, its relationship to exercise, things like that. But first, comments Comments. from... from... The haters. We only have one today. Nobody else made the cut. No fap gamer. This is our favorite one. Why are Mark's nipples hard? <laughs> I can't stand it. Is he some kind of pervert? <laughs> And the man says, the man who asked me if, <laughs> why are my nipples hard? He, he saw my nipple. He, yeah, <laughs> it's just so fucked up. On comments Comment from, from the, the haters. haters. Okay. <laughs> We're here with our friend Robert Santana. Robert is in from phoenix robert has a new gym in phoenix mm-hmm. where's the gym gym is in phoenix uh so. i just said it was in phoenix. Where, where in phoenix well if you let phoenix me finish is, phoenix is huge it's in the center of phoenix right south of the airport right in the dead ass middle of town between tempe and phoenix right by the city limits is tempe a suburb of phoenix or was once upon a time in another town well, there's a bunch of suburbs of Phoenix. But what is Scottsdale? Is that a, another another one? Yeah, another one of these equivalent to yeah, it's a big suburb. Yeah, it's got its own city council and uh-huh. its own crime problem and there's Phoenix homelessness. Yeah. I don't know if you can be homeless in 118 degree weather. They figured it out. Have they? Yeah, they figured they're, they're actually homeless they're, people uh, in Phoenix uh, on the floor in the sun sometimes. <laughs> 115. Yeah. How long can you lay in the sun at 115 degrees and not be dead? I haven't figured that out yet. Well, good. Let's yeah. hope that you're fortunate enough, or rather industrious enough, to never need to. I hope not. You just keep the needle out of your arm, you'll be okay. okay? Yeah, so far so good. Yep, good. Yeah, I'm, I've, I'm successfully not a drug addict myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somehow, I just don't like, hell, I don't even like being drunk that much. I mean, I get that way, but (laughs) it's not my favorite thing. So, uh, Robert, let's talk about diet and nutrition. And, you know, this is Mm -hmm. one of the – there's a subset of people on the board Mm -hmm. who come there specifically to talk about nutrition. There's a subset of the fitness industry that is obsessed with this. And – I, unfortunately, am not a member of that subset, and I just don't care. <laughs> you know? It's, but you uh, did once upon a time. At one time, I did. I think all young men uh, are concerned about abs because mm-hmm. they hadn't yet figured out that women don't care about your abs. <laughs> and uh, they eventually do figure it out, and they go ahead and get a little belly back, and it's it's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, I was appalled one time when a... Uh, I had an older guy trained at the gym with us. Eh, not old. He was probably 45 at the time. I was in my, you know, 30s. This guy was a little older than us. And I had a girlfriend that was, uh, oh, she was a, you know, fairly attractive 47-year-old woman. Okay. Been around the block eight or ten times. <laughs> Knew her shit. Yeah. Kind of girl I appreciate. I know the deal. Know? And she, I was in a conversation with her one time about about a belly for some reason. She (laughs) says, there's nothing wrong with a belly on a man. What the hell is wrong with you? 
And I said, of course there's something wrong. People are people shouldn't be fat. And she just laughed at me. Wait, you said this? Yes. Mm-hmm. I said people shouldn't be fat. Ripto said that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I'm 63. I've changed my mind. <laughs> you know? And, and I, as I've gotten older, mm-hmm. and I've talked to more and more women about this, uh, I uh, have been made aware of the fact that they don't care about your abs a whole bunch of women mature useful women Mm -hmm. not 14 year old girls but mature (laughs) useful women tend to regard a man with abs who's you know wants focused on his abs as a ripped as a goofy little twink you know a little vain useless pain in the ass that's that's what they think guys you know, and the comments from the hater mm-hmm. shit is going to oh, yeah. be full of remarks about milk drinking fat. He's a slob. He's a Texan, <laughs> and he's he's stupid, and uh, he spells two with two O's, <laughs> and he, which is unnecessary work. And I hate him, and he's. He's a fat queer, so, right? So I, y'all, y'all go ahead. But I'm telling you, this this is, you know, the, the, you are. I don't think you, they realize this is, really. they don't realize yeah. the big picture here. All right. Well, I think they also don't realize that you have pursued abs in your life at certain. Yeah, points. I mean, I was yeah. that was this, I made the same fucking mistakes that you guys are <laughs> thinking right now, and I outgrew it. You know. Uh, I saw your old training logs. I'm telling you, and Robert and I are going to discuss this aesthetic thing here, and we'll just we'll do this first. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, but but I I think the bottom line here is that a guy who's overly obsessed with his abs Mm -hmm. uh, is a young man who has got an incomplete picture of the universe. Because I don't think, you know, grown women <laughs> are interested in your eight pack. I really no. don't. I've in fact had women say that they start feeling insecure about their own bodies when the man's body is more defined than theirs. Right. Yeah. And, well, that's that's yeah. part of the deal. Yeah. That's part of it. And uh, uh, part of it is probably what the de- they detect that you're obsessed about. Yeah, vanity. Yeah, that's the you know perception if they detect of it. the the vanity obsession. They're not interested in your shit. Yeah. you know. Yeah, that's the perception of it that you're vain and you're more concerned with your own appearance and the appearance of the woman you're with. You know, right? And then you start eating weird because if you don't naturally have visible abs, right? As you know, it's high maintenance. High maintenance to keep. Yeah. It's not realistic. High right. maintenance. If, Where do you think uh, abs appear in terms of body fat percentage? I know it's different for. Everybody, but I think you can probably see abs yeah. at twelve percent, thirteen, maybe even fourteen percent. That's a very good question. So that depends on how much muscle mass you have, how, right. how yeah. much yeah. muscularity your abs yeah. possess. So a guy who's twelve percent body fat at two forty is going to have more visible abs than a guy who's twelve percent body fat at one fifty. Right. 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 Because it's like the, the analogy I like to use is a pillow. Right. You have a pillow. You start putting solid objects in it like a ro- like rocks or bricks or mm-hmm. anything that's solid and you're going to start seeing that present more mm-hmm. right put a few marbles in it you might not you'll see more of the pillow itself right so uh that's that tends to be the problem is that these boys that read this stuff right. m- me having been one of them you having mm-hmm. been one me of them having been one of I think them too that's a point to be clarified because they listen to us talk they're like well, you're fat what are you you're talking fat. about robert's yeah. fat, fat. Ripto's fat. What does he know? You're fat. I, <laughs> yeah, you're fat. Well, well yeah. we know. We've done it. We've done it. Yeah. We okay. know. And, and and we know that you need to grow the fuck up. All right? Hurry. Grow the fuck up. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I have always said, in terms of body fat percentage, I, I don't think that, you know, now, and, and well, like, you, like you'd mentioned, there are people... Who walk around at twelve percent with no effort being made yeah. to do it? Yep. You know they just 
They just hang around in their 12%. These are the kind of guys that can get down with a bunch of work, can get down to 8, 7, 6% body fat. But a guy who mm-hmm. walks around at 18, 20% body fat, mm-hmm. who may be a fabulous athlete, who mm-hmm. may be perfectly uh, capable of carrying quite a bit of muscle, Right. It's just not going to have veins on their abs. No. And there aren't going to be any circumstances under which he can get them. Right. And and, and any attempt to try is just going to piss everybody around you off. Yeah, you start being weird. You can't eat right. Yeah, yeah. go to Thanksgiving yeah. with a guy like that. <laughs> oh, God, I was that guy. Just standing in the quarter, just eating the turkey, and that's it. Eating the turkey and... Maybe having yeah. a piece of lettuce yeah. and shit. And, Stayed away from the you pie. Have any, you don't have any white rice, do you? No, no, Mark, we don't have white rice yeah. at Thanksgiving. We have cornbread right. dressing and giblet gravy, and you need to shut up and sit down and eat your Thanksgiving dinner. And then you're hungry the and, whole time. And quit being weird. That's what right. you need to do, Mark. I don't understand you. Please explain yourself. And, you know, what can you do? Because you think it's rational behavior. Oh, yeah, you're like, well... I'm a healthy guy. I'm trying to not be fat. Yeah, abs. I'm not fat. You know, I have abs. I'm abs. It's the picture of health. And your aunt doesn't care about that, now does she? No, <clears throat> no, she cares about you hanging out with her on Thanksgiving and and not being a, a weirdo yeah. and making everybody else's ass uncomfortable. Yeah, that's what she cares about. And yeah. you know, she doesn't understand because she's an older person and she understands the bigger picture mm-hmm. that you don't seem to understand. Uh, now, I you know, and, and this is going to get interpreted is I want everybody to be three hundred pounds overweight, <laughs> four fifty. You know, four fifty. Yeah. Everybody needs to weigh four fifty. Everybody needs to gain weight. Everybody needs to gain weight. Everybody needs to be a big fat slop. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what to be in the. So you're saying every single. So what person. you're saying is that everyone needs to be fat. Everybody. <laughs> That's what I heard you say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They actually heard it. Yeah. It's like somebody who has anorexia nervosa. Well, they look in the mirror. They see a fat person. And they see, and I've asked a girl about this before, mm-hmm. they actually see a fat person. Oh, yeah. They don't see what's, and I, I really don't understand it. I, you, have you been around people like that with that particular psychological disorder that, perceive them they don't just perceive themselves to be i need to lose five pounds when they look in the mirror the image apparently i don't i, yeah, I, I don't i don't understand they I, see 300 pound person that's that's i what, guess that's they how, do that's how they describe it at least i don't know what it in, in fact looks it, you like, can't but, get into their yeah, head no but, you know what i was just, what i will you, say is this when i did it i got down to 11 percent body fat and i remember when i was getting near the end of it I just never felt like I was lean enough. And when I look at those pictures now, I'm like, how on earth did I think I wasn't lean enough? I mean, I can see everything. But at the time, right. it starts to fuck right. with your head is what ends yeah. up happening. Yeah, I think it probably does. Yeah. I remember long, this has been long years ago but when I was in my 20s, I was mm-hmm. kind of at one point obsessed with this. Because I think all of us start off lifting and we we're, we start off thinking about aesthetics and we think that, you know, we have to have abs. Mm-hmm. We, you know, in the back of our mind, we know we need to be big. Yes. But we think we can substitute abs for big mm-hmm. and have the abs be the aesthetics. But that's not, you know. Well, my observation was this. So when I first got into this, probably what, 02, that's when all those men's health, men's fitness was booming. Everybody wanted Still to. Still in yeah, the grocery yeah, store yeah, shelves. Yeah. Right? Right up at yeah. the checkout. Yeah. This is before Instagram. And everybody wanted to look like a 170 pound fitness model. And uh, all I would see was the abs. And for me, I had a brother, a stepbrother, so we're not blood related. It was my father's second marriage. So he was Polish, so he had good Eastern European genes. Mm-hmm. And he had visible abs. He was probably sitting at 11% body fat. He was 180, and he had played football, and he'd done barbell training. Not very well, but enough to get a result because the guy was what we would call mesomorph, or if you want to mm-hmm. use somatotyping. Yeah, you know? right, right. He just builds muscle real easy. And all I saw was the abs because that's what he was concerned with. He wanted to have right. abs, and for him, he just died a little bit, and he would have abs because he sat at 12%. 
So in my mind, I'm like, okay, he's doing that. Those guys in the magazine covers look kind of like him but a little leaner. Mm -hmm. So I need to get abs, but then I couldn't get abs. And what I, in fact, found out over time was I just wasn't big enough. I didn't have enough muscle mass. And then I started looking around the gym, and I'd see these guys that were clearly, you know, fatter, probably like what I would consider now over 20%, 20 to 25% body mm -hmm. fat. But they had visible deltoids. You know, they had big traps, you know, big legs. Big neck. Big neck, big forearms. Big forearms. Still big had vein veins. Forearms. Yeah, yeah. But they had a little bit of a belly. So I, that, that, that was the first time I asked myself, I'm like, how is it that this guy has muscle definition and I don't? And the answer that I arrived to was, well, he has more muscle mass. So yeah, imagine that. Imagine. Yeah. Imagine. A moment of clarity here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, I like your observation in the article you did for us recently that the muscle mass that – makes the most difference in aesthetics, the most difference in your physical appearance, mm -hmm. uh, is muscle mass that is specifically built by the deadlift. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's an interesting observation. I'd never thought about it like that way. Never thought about it like that before. And it's uh, what you see in a man who is uh, standing there in a shirt, mm -hmm. a man standing there in clothes, in normal clothes, a short sleeve shirt and pants, okay? Because normal men don't stand around with their shirt off, boys. That's not normal. People don't do that. People can't see a 155-pound man's abs unless you force them on them. But it happens on Instagram. Yeah, it happens on Instagram, yeah. That's Standing there in your kitchen with your shirt off, making egg whites with your abs all over the place and you somehow think that people want to see this shit well normal people are, are in clothes all right in public they're in clothes and when <laughs> you see somebody in clothes in public you don't see their abs what you do see is traps traps deltoids deltoids lats lats forearms yep. And a big neck, mm -hmm. a big muscular neck, an 18-inch neck, mm -hmm. you know, makes. And these are the, the aesthetic signals of the male physique. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, it's the a, golden ratio? Have you heard of this? Uh, I've, I've, there is a, I remember the ideal proportions, yeah. you know, Frank Zane kind of shit. Stems off that, yeah. Where if you're going to have... If you got an 18 inch neck to be in balance, your arms need to be 18 inches. Something like that, yeah. And then your forearms are some percentage yeah. of that, like 70% of that, some kind of deal. I always thought Arnold's forearms were a little small. Yeah, I thought so too for yeah. how big everything else for, was. As big as everything else was, he needed some forearm mass. But if you think about the exercise that builds those visual male aesthetic symbols what you come up with is the deadlift mm -hmm. and the bench and the press you press more than the bench i would argue probably yeah probably yeah. because the pecs aren't particularly visible yeah i mean uh, yeah in a, in a shirt that's your got huge but pecs the, or you're wearing a tight the, shirt the spread of the shoulder width yeah right what are you, what are you tearing up my phone <laughs> Oh, it's your phone. As long as it's just your phone, that's fine. <laughs> so it's it's the 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 uh, the deadlift, the bench, and the press. The deadlift and the press. Mm -hmm. The deadlift and the press are the things that uh, build muscle mass in the places that signal to the observer that you are muscular. That you're muscular, and this mm -hmm. is. Way down deep in the DNA, I think. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? I would say so. Think about it. In a primitive situation, you got to be able to climb shit. You got to be able to lift things up. You know. Well, you know, yeah. you're an apparently strong yeah. man. Yeah. Is more useful, and that's from hundreds of thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. and this is still laying there down in your DNA, and the uh, the exercises that build. Those visible 
visual signals. Well, let's also not forget, too, that the deadlift and the press build bigger abs, too. Yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they do. They The deadlift, yeah. deadlift and the press, the deadlift and the press builds uh, a thick section of muscle around the spine. Abs. Which, Abs, erectors, erectors uh, obliques, obliques, all yeah. that stuff gets big. A little skinny waist mm-hmm. is not a little skinny waist is not the the signal we're looking yeah. for. No, what are we looking for? We're looking for big. We're looking for big, strong upper body yeah. relative to, to, to waist. To waist, yeah. So a large uh, shoulder girdle in relation to waist, and big that does neck, big yeah. shoulders, lat sweep. But not a 29-inch waist. No, that's bodybuilder. That's bodybuilder yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's not even good bodybuilder stuff. No, those... You know, Arnold, good bodybuilders don't have a 29-inch waist. I think Arnold was... Over, I think even Zane was at 30, right? 31? Zane was probably 30, 31. I, I don't think he was sub-30. You know, but... Yeah, but people that, Those are the bodybuilders of the 70s and early 80s. Yeah. You know, modern bodybuilders, the mm-hmm. guys that win the Olympia, mm-hmm. are big... Yeah, men. it's a different game. They're, yeah, they're big men, and but uh, even then, their upper body is wider. What than do you waist. think Yates's waist was? Oh, probably thirty-five, thirty-five or six. Yeah, I would, I think. would think so. You have to look. But it in up. contrast to his waist, he had these enormous slabs of lats and deltoids and deltoids, traps, like a bunch of yeah. bananas. Traps. Yeah, you know. I had a girl ask me recently, she's like, oh, I want deltoid caps. And I'm like, well, the way they look is completely genetically determined. Completely genetically yeah. determined. However, if you press sufficiently and get stronger at pressing, they will be more visible yes. for what you have. You know? Because, but the, the, the part that kind of peels back under the yeah. capstone yeah. looking deltoids, that is, yeah. you can't train that. No. That is genetic, and it's not, it's not something you should try to obtain because it can't be done. If you don't have any calves, you can't, you can't grow calves. No. You can't grow calves. I mean, how and much of a percentage do you think they'll grow from training? I don't know. If you don't have, if you've got little bitty calves, mm-hmm. you're never going to have great big, huge. They'll be less fat small. calves. They'll be less tiny. Yeah, but they'll still be tiny. And, and you'll have to train them seven days a week to, to get them to get less get them, tidy. To get them to get less tiny. And yeah. That's just so stupid. So I, I learned uh, about this with arms, Rip. Yeah. I experimented with an arm program that I found on the Internet. And uh, it required, it was basically German volume training. Ten sets of ten, three exercises for biceps, three for, so you're doing like 2,000 curls a week because you're doing it every day. And I lasted oh, about man. a month and a half. But my biceps went from mediocre to a little bit less mediocre. A little bit, and that's yeah. all. Yeah. Despite yeah. having devoted all yeah. this time and energy to, yeah. to the situation. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's obvious to me that elite bodybuilders are born. Yeah. You know, yeah, they they have to train real hard. But if you are not walking around at 12% body fat, you're not going to be a bodybuilder. No. And... What, what percentage of the population walks around at 12% body fat? That's a small percentage, probably. Like 5%? Yeah, probably. 5% of, 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 the, of the white population. Mm-hmm. Probably a much larger percentage of the, of the black population mm-hmm. walks around. There's differences racially in these, in these groups. No, then there's skin, too, to consider. And then skin thickness yeah. is another. That's a mm-hmm. variable that has to mm-hmm. be. And you can't control that. There's, no. you can, you can, and pay lip service to controlling body fat all day long. But if right. you've got thick skin, mm-hmm. you're gonna look like you're fat when you're not. Yep. You know that's a hundred percent. I remember this girl that I knew when I was, I don't know, seventeen. I would just skin fold on her, and uh, she was really lean. Or she wasn't like super lean, but I couldn't, couldn't pinch. Yeah. That tight. Yeah, it was just tight, thick skin. Thick skin. Yeah, and it happens. I. Yeah. Tested lots of people like that. I had a guy with a big belly once, and I thought, oh, this will be easy. And then could not get it because the skin was so damn thick. Couldn't get the adipose right. tissue, mm-hmm. the subcutaneous fat. I've had, I've tested lots, yeah. skin fold, tested lots and lots of people that I could not obtain a uh, 
and these are people that weren't particularly fat, mm -hmm. but I could not get a a good skin fold thigh pinch. Pinch, yeah. I could it just wouldn't. That, it was too tight. It was like a drum. That you know? one's common. The um the belly was the one that threw me off when there was obviously plenty of fat to work with, and, mm -hmm. I, and I couldn't get it. Couldn't get it. Couldn't yeah. get the pinch. Nope. Because the tension in the skin. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It's uh. So people don't understand that either. No, um, no, they don't understand lots of things. But, but when you're trying to mess around with body fat to the point where you're getting into single-digit body fat, it's not sustainable because it goes against every survival mechanism you have. Yeah. You need body fat. It's like, it's like cleaning out your savings account. Mm -hmm. Spending all your money. You're going to do that? I mean, some people might, but... You well, know, it happens not, in California yeah, yeah. all the time. Hey, <laughs> time to make the house pay. It's not you advantageous, know. though. No. It puts you in a bad situation. So <clears throat> biologically, that's the same thing with body fat. You start getting below a certain point, and this is another important thing to clarify. Um, you know, you're saying 12%. For some people, that point might be 18%. So there's a lot of variability there. Some people have to sit a little bit heavier, and that's right. okay. You know, Yeah, people yeah. walking around at 18% body fat. As you get older, that's going to go up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm walking around about what did we say twenty five twenty five probably twenty five percent body fat. Yeah. Oh, listen, can you hear the haters typing? Oh, he's thirty. He's forty five if he's an ounce. So we're going by skin folds here, not Dexa, right? Because Dexa's bullshit. Dexa will put you at thirty. Ah, Dexa's yeah. bullshit. <laughs> it's not what Dexa's for. So uh, yeah. you you've got a uh, you got a situation where mm -hmm. there's wide variability throughout mm -hmm. the population in terms of walking around without any effort body fat. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, variations in skin, appearance, tone, flexibility. Uh, you've got variations in, in the shape of musculature, mm -hmm. shape of the musculature. All of these things that are primarily controlled by genetics. Mm -hmm. The only thing we can actually really have a good handle on is the growth of muscle mass especially large muscle mass small muscle mass glutes I, I think it'd be fair to say that small muscle mass is more genetically influenced than large muscle mass and the yeah. shape of the insertions yeah. and stuff yeah. like to yeah. be blessed with nice long bicep insertions yeah. that come all the way down to there, you've got to, you can't be a bodybuilder without yeah. that. You just they, they throw you out of the contest. But you can grow you know, lats. But you can grow lats, quads, quads, and you can uh, grow traps. traps. Mm -hmm. You can grow traps. I used to think you couldn't, but I also used to not deadlift. Yeah, and uh, traps grow pretty quick. Oh yeah, you get your deadlift up real heavy. One of the first things that happens is you your traps get bigger. Your traps get bigger, and along with your traps, your neck gets bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we say that, we're talking about the entire trapezius muscle, yes, all the way down the whole thing yeah. from the base of the skull down mm -hmm. to T seven. Mm -hmm. The whole thing gets bigger. Your lats get big when you deadlift. Mm -hmm. Your lats are uh, the lats on an eight hundred deadlifter are huge. Creatures. Always, and they're always big. And I recently stopped chinning probably a year ago just because it hasn't been a priority, and yeah. my lats are bigger than they've ever been. Right. But my deadlift has continued to grow up. Right. Grow up. So I know one of these haters is out there saying, well, Santana's not that big. Well, I'm, I'm talking about in relation to before. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. You're up to 185. Yeah. I fuck with you because you're not 200. Yeah. Right. But you're headed in that direction. Right. You've seen the error of your ways. I mean, I think you need to... Try the cake a day diet. Cake <laughs> seemed to work. Well, cake a day. So, if you'll if you'll get uh, get up over two hundred and you get your deadlift up to five fifty, I there it seems like there's just a point in time when your pulls are heavy, mm -hmm. heavy rack pulls, mm -hmm. heavy barbell shrugs, heavy deadlifts, and your traps just go. Whoo, and it doesn't take that long. Well, this was funny. So last time I got down real lean, I got mm -hmm. this was the leanest I ever got, and I don't know that I would attempt this again. 
but I was 11% body fat at about 165. Yeah. And that was on a DEXA, so you'd say that I'm probably 8 or 9. You might have been. Yeah. yeah. DEXA put me at Although, 11. I don't know that the, the, the error in DEXA is absolutely linear. No. I don't know. There, there, there's probably a curve there someplace. Yeah. And it might be that down in low body fats. It might be more accurate. Dex is more accurate. Yeah. Uh, it'd be an interesting thing to, yeah. to see. So I was at about 11.9, and uh, I was I did a hike. And when I got to the top of the hike, this is Flatiron in uh, Mesa, Arizona, for those of you interested. It's a pretty cool hike. It's right. a f- about a five-mile hike up a... Uh, up a mountain, so there's a lot of climbing, and I'd say that the lifting helped quite a bit with that. Um, Everybody tells I, I, me that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't, I don't Everybody hike, so that. that was a baseline hike. Right. And I got up it just fine. Now the straightaways were a bit of a problem because, you know, there's this long stretch of jogging I had to do. And right. Just the cardio respiratory part was a bitch. Anyways, I'm kind of detracting here. So when I got to the top, I took a shirtless photo uh, from behind. And I couldn't, and I was disappointed. I, was, I couldn't see shit. But at the time, my deadlift was 440. So then I gained weight. So I went up to 175. I pushed my deadlift up to 500, and then I can see everything with more body fat. So that's right. I just posted about this on the board, and uh, that's because I gained more muscle in relation to fat in that area. You don't deposit a lot of fat in your upper back. No, you know? no. So the problem for me was how my 11% body fat. I can't see my traps because I just don't have enough muscle mass. So going from a 440 deadlift to a 500 deadlift and gaining 10 pounds, probably half of which was fat, I can see more because my deadlift went up and my mm-hmm. traps got bigger, lats got bigger, forearms got bigger. And I, I really want you to think mm-hmm. about how this applies to going to 220. You know, I want you to think about this mm-hmm. too. Let's say your body fat goes from 14% to 18% and you gain – a uh, total of 25 pounds, 30 yeah. pounds of, of body weight. Right. What do you think is going to happen? You think people are going to say, oh, my God, he's 18% body fat. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, God, Western civilization excess. Oh, my God, first world problems. <laughs> 18% body, that's so embarrassing. I so feel so bad for him. So, Rip, what tends I, to happen yeah. is this. When they hear you say that and they try to do it, the amount of weight on the bar doesn't match the amount of weight put on the human body we're right. dealing with. Right. And then they end up a fat, sloppy mess at 220, squatting 220, body weight squat, right. and they'll say, Rip Toe yeah. me up 220. Rip Toe's program doesn't work because I gained 30 pounds of body weight. Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah, I know I wasn't deadlifting, and uh, you know, squat <laughs> squat went up eighty pounds. But but the program doesn't work because I got fat. I pressed one hundred. <laughs> I, I, we've seen this. Yes, it's on your board. Yes, it's walked into my gym, walked into your walks gym, walks into mine, walks into yours. It's so, always the case. We need to beat this when point home. You, you people have to train the pull. You got to train your squat. You got to get these numbers up. Not just the calorie numbers, not just the body weight numbers. The calorie numbers and the body weight numbers facilitate the numbers on the bar. And the numbers on the bar facilitate the muscle mass growth. And you have got to understand that your strength has to go up commensurate with diet Mm -hmm. and body weight. And if it's not, then you're going to get fat, and that's not what we're. Te- but that's not what we're telling you to do. Mm-hmm. But that's what you think we're mm-hmm. telling you to do. You think we're telling a guy that's been training two years, who is 225 pounds already at five nine, and let's say he's deadlifting 455. Mm-hmm. You think we're telling him to drink a gallon of milk a day. <laughs> because that's funny. Yeah. Right? But That's what you said. It's not true. Ripito said that. And I never <laughs> and I, but Anyway. So here's Anyway, this. so all right, let's 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 get to let's let's get to a guy that is two forty five mm-hmm. and he's five nine. Mm-hmm. And he's deadlifting 455. For how many? 
sits about. Okay. So he's right? pretty strong. Pretty strong boy. Mm-hmm. But he's probably walking around. This guy's legitimately walking around at 30% body fat. Mm-hmm. What do we do with him? Well, he's got to lose weight. He does. Yes. He needs yeah. to to cut body fat. He needs to cut body fat. Mm-hmm. Listen. So he needs a, to cut body fat. and He has uh, to go on a cut. He has to go on a cut. He said that. You heard that, right? He has to go on a cut. Yeah. You know, whenever I hear the word cut... <laughs> I, I think about what you do to a horse, <laughs> and I. So, that connotation is yeah. You know, I've never enjoyed saying that. So, mm-hmm. uh, go on. But we're but legitimately, a guy that's that's walking around at thirty percent body mm-hmm. fat has got a different problem than you little bastards who are walking around at eighteen percent body fat, thinking that you need to go on a cut. It's not the same thing. Well, what is a, what is percent body fat? It is a ratio of body fat to muscle mass. So if you're eighteen percent body fat at one hundred and forty five pounds, is body fat the issue? No, no, no. Look. You lack muscle mass. Yeah, that's why you're eighteen percent body fat. Your yeah. percent muscle mass is too low. That's what's happening. Right. And if at eighteen percent body fat you go from one forty five. To 185 pounds, and you fix things up so that of that 40 pounds of body weight gain, 10 pounds of it was fat, then your body fat percentage is going to be what 19, 20 percent. Something like that, then, yeah. But you're going to look like a different human male. But a guy you're that going to look like a different guy, and if you go on up. To 20%, but do it at 215. I mean, you're not going to be a you're not going to be a skinny looking guy. You're going to have a little bit of a belly, but see, and, and my yeah. point is yeah. that that you'll look better. Mm-hmm. You'll look better to the rest of the human race at 215 and 20% body fat than you did at 145 but i venture to guess 18 percent i would venture to guess at 215 he's probably pulling 500 at least at least yeah should be yeah he should can certainly could be that's not a big deadlift at that body weight no so i think uh the criticism and the misunderstanding here are the guys that come in at buck 60 buck 70 17 percent body fat um for whatever reason they uh struggle to get reasonably strong and they gain 30 or 40 pounds get up to 210 and they have a 225 squat and a 255 deadlift yeah and so you're just not training hard yeah or you're not doing a program yeah, if you yeah. do that you're not doing a program. <laughs> we've seen them though they exist oh yeah and they're the ones that are typing on your board they're the ones yeah. that are yeah. on the board complaining about on somebody else's board yeah complaining about how starting strength doesn't work starting strength got them fat right starting strength got an exercise program got them fat yeah because you told them to drink gallon of milk a day they right. did it and they were squatting 225 right now i have a guy that i trained um he's in the show business and uh he's got a runner's build he's got long legs short torso real thin and slender but uh, physique and uh, you could tell he's built to run long distances and he tried the whole gallon of milk a day thing got up to 190 at six foot and he was barely squatting 225 <laughs> and right i deadlifted 305 for four and he had a 38-inch belly. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then he had to get himself down. It took it, uh, We trained for five years now, so now he's that weight again, but he doesn't look fat. But this is an outlier, I would say, right? Mm-hmm. If you're an endurance athlete and you know you're an endurance athlete, the weight gain thing is probably not going to work too favorable for these people. Right. That's, no, probably, that's fair to say. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not because mm-hmm. – uh, they're predisposed to endurance athletics because of, you know, muscle type. Fiber types, yeah. Fiber types, that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, it's harder for some people to gain muscle mass than it is to gain, for other people to gain muscle mass, especially if they won't quit running. Oh, yeah. This guy wasn't running. He, he's been, he really was not running. Yeah. You, you met him before, a long time ago. But, yeah. no, he was not running. He was just training. He was trying to get put muscle on his body, but he was built like a runner. And uh, he said that endurance activity comes easy to him. Um, 
So now he's about 190, and uh, his waist is about 36, I think. But you can't – he doesn't look like a mess. He looks good. You know? Yeah. And he's deadlifting 340 for a set of five. But it's taken years, and then he's had a weight cycle in between, which is, I think, something we should talk about because there's – remember we were talking about how, let's say you go on a cut. Go on a cut. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cut. <laughs> and uh, let's say you lose 20 pounds or 30 pounds, um, and it's been three, four months. And then you come off of this caloric deficit. So you've been starving at this point. And then you come off this, and you start eating at even maintenance. Then there's this rebound effect that happens. You've seen it. I've seen it. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you build muscle faster immediately off of a fat loss period. Yeah, your body yeah. appreciates the anabolic conditions you've yeah. reintroduced. Yeah. Right. So this is, I think, when I was talking to you about this, you would mentioned this, you know, the bodybuilders is what they do, cutting and bulking. And that's kind of like mm-hmm. the whole idea, right? So there's like this rebound effect that I've noticed having done it several times. And uh, then there's also a point where additional weight gain is additional fat gain. Have you seen this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that once you get to a no bullshit intermediate advanced status that you're going to be doing this. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Stan Efferding and I were, were yeah, yeah. talking about this recently, and this yeah. is this is typical this is a typical approach because it works. Yeah, you know it mm-hmm. works. You concentrate mm-hmm. for a while and get your body weight up. Mm-hmm. Train heavy, train heavy. Eat as much as you need mm-hmm. to support the heavy training, which mm-hmm. is going to be a bunch of, bunch of food. Yeah, and then when it comes time, you're going to. Try to cut body fat mm-hmm. while trying to keep the muscle. Mm-hmm. Skew that that uh, weight loss, weight gain percentage of muscle mass with, with diet. And you don't do stupid things that are catabolic, like, like run. Or 15s. Or 15. Remember when so that or, was fashionable? Or two hours on the bicycle. Yeah. You know. Because if you're concurrently training for strength and training for endurance— and the professional research people have agreed with us on this. What, that Hickson paper, 1985, you remember that one? No. They put them on 10 weeks of strength training, 10 weeks of endurance training, and 10 weeks of both. And uh, the strength training was five sets of five squats, five sets of five bench. And I don't know how deep those squats were, but it was 1985. We can hope that they right. might have been deeper. Might have been. Maybe it was 83. I don't know the exact year for you know, retentive academic people somewhere in the 80s but uh what they discovered was that after about a certain point a certain week so they had a novice effect you know they got stronger Mm -hmm. the combo group i'm referring to combo group got stronger up to a certain week then after that week their strength declined whereas the strength only group continued to get stronger and the endurance only group continued to improve from a cardiorespiratory standpoint so it kind of makes sense when you think about it logically. You're putting in more volume when you're doing an endurance activity because think yeah. about running. How many strides are you going to put in right. versus 25 squats? Numbers of strides, numbers of contractions. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to so you're going to adapt to that preferentially, which is why, okay, if it's time to lose body fat, that doesn't mean it's time to train for a marathon. Right. Yeah. Which is the right. misconception. Because the, it's the easiest way. Mm-hmm. To lose all the muscle mass you gained during the weight, uh, during the, the the weight gain phase yep. of this of this cycle, because it's not advantageous for that type of activity. No, you know, no, it's not. Endurance athletics do not. Uh, see, and here's one of the most prevalent myths mm-hmm. in the general public mm-hmm. and in the fitness industry: mm-hmm. you can't run off body fat. No. I mean, if you do. If you're running enough miles a month to run off body fat, mm-hmm. you're you're like a full timer. They did. Know? There was a, and you know these things have their massive inaccuracies. But there was a meta analysis uh, a few years ago yeah. that looked at all the you know randomized controlled trials on exercise and weight loss. By exercise, I mean aerobic exercise. Right. That's what they mean yeah. by exercise, yeah. too. When they, it's ridiculous. When they say exercise... Yeah. When they say exercise, oh, they yeah. mean minutes. Yeah. Exercise, minutes yeah. of repetitive, yeah. slow, long yeah. distance. Right? Exercise training means aerobic exercise training. Right. Exercise physiology means aerobic exercise physiology. Right. Yeah. right. Exercise yeah. physiologists yeah. are runners. Essentially. And cyclists. Yes. Yeah. Triathletes. Triathletes. Maybe a swimmer here and there. 
they usually end up lifting my experience um they have real good presses yeah swimmers dude. yeah might explain why mine's decent i used to swim um so what was i talking about i lost my train of thought um you preferentially adapt to aerobic exercise when you're doing both so you yeah, should we're not talking yeah, about yeah, the, yeah. the hicks and stuff. oh yeah no we're talking about the meta-analysis so it's meta-analysis um what they found was they averaged out all the deltas from the various papers that were published on this topic, and they said that to get a significant amount of fat loss, a statistically significant net change in body fat from aerobic exercise, that's all they're cha- the only variable they're changing, mm-hmm. you would have to do, oh, 420 minutes a week for six months. So that's an hour a day, seven days a week for six months. Do you know what a significant amount of fat loss is from a statistical standpoint? No, I don't. Probably not. Five to seven pounds. Yeah, it's not, yeah. It's not double yeah. digit. But. Five to seven pounds. So an hour a day, and again, this is, at, I didn't mention this, at moderate intensity, meaning these people are wearing heart rate monitors and having to run pretty hard. Right. You know, for an hour. 120. Yeah. yeah. 130, somewhere yeah. in there. Seven days a week. Right. For six months to lose seven pounds. Sell that. See, to it's you. just not. It's not productive. But it's yeah. the most yeah. pervasive myth. Man, yeah. I just had a. I had two chili dogs for lunch. I've got to go to the gym to burn those off. <laughs> I, I think. You I, I do think that it helps indirectly. I don't know how. I, I was talking to Kirkham about this. He swears by it that some level of aerobic work helps. A lot of people yeah, have yeah. said, yeah. I and mean, there's a lot of bodybuilding coaches that will have mm-hmm. their their clients go out in the morning mm-hmm. for the eat and run. Yeah. I hear that all the time. I don't know. I there don't know. Seems to be something to it. I don't have any idea. But in the absence of a, a dietary mm-hmm. intervention, that's not going to do anything. No. It really is not. Yeah, just running with no diet change. No, there's... An hour a day for six months. <laughs> no, <you> I've <laughs> seen... There's a runner's group at the downtown YMCA yeah. here in Wichita Falls for years. Guys that run every day at lunch for, you know, 45 minutes. You ever notice... the fat guys. <laughs> you ever notice at these commercial gyms, I don't know how often you go into those anymore. I haven't been in one in a long the, time. The... Uh, I call it the cardio row in the back. You know, you see the same people there at the same time every day, and you'll see them a year from now, and they, and they look the same. And you'll see them two years from now, and they'll look the same. And you'll right. see them five years from now, and they'll look the same. But they're in there sweating away on the treadmill or stairmaster, and uh, mm-hmm. you don't no visible changes. Right. Yeah. I've also <laughs> we did a we did a, a seminar in a commercial gym mm-hmm. in uh, Kentucky really several years ago and we were in there on Sunday morning because our program started starts at eight o'clock on Sunday morning and I uh, this little skinny blonde girl was in there you know 55 year yeah. old 55 year old 105 pound woman and she was in there on the treadmills for three hours. Three hours. Mm-hmm. Right? But I did not assume that the reason she was only 105 was because she was on the treadmill for three hours. <laughs> I know that the reason she was 105 <laughs> is because of what she did not have to eat that day. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it was, it was a striking. This woman's, you know, you could see her lungs. Her, <laughs> she, was, she was so skinny. Internal. Look, there's her spleen. You know, you can't. Yeah. yeah, it's just bizarre. You ever read? How, how catabolic the girl was. She was just nothing much left of her. You, you ever know? read uh, Marlon Brando's autobiography or seen, no. seen the documentary? No. He was talking about how, you know, in Hollywood they have to look a certain way on screen. And, he, and, you know, he's obviously talking about 60s, 70s, um, and uh, or probably 50s, actually. 70s, he was already older. But uh, he's like, yeah, you know, these actresses, you know, when they w- want to look good, or these actors, they just don't eat. 
Imagine that. I, I imagine how that works. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> you know, Brando, did you see One Eyed Jacks? You ever seen that movie, yeah. One Eyed yeah. Jacks? Yeah. He was a handsome man. Oh, yeah. You know, he was. He was a muscular, you know. He's just yeah. born that way. I don't mm-hmm. think he, I don't think he trained. Well, he, had that he was a yeah. he was a heartthrob, man. Mm-hmm. He was a heartthrob. He was a he was a man's man yeah. back then. Yeah. He's a real masculine, brutal actor, mm-hmm. like Streetcar Named Desire. Yeah. yeah. Oh God damn. The classic. You know. Yeah, classic. That's you know. I. <laughs> it's just a little aside here. My mother. Had the biggest crush on Clark Gable. Yeah. She loved Clark Gable. Oh, she couldn't hardly stand to watch Gone with the Wind because she just loved Clark Gable. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to see anybody. She didn't want anybody to see her looking at Clark Gable. (laughs) But she just was in love with Clark Gable. Yeah. But by the same token, she did not like Marlon Brando. (laughs) Really? Really? And I don't know... The deal was, but he scared her, I think. <laughs> I think he scared my mother. Because he had a completely different presentation than oh, Clark yeah. Gable. Oh, yeah. Oh, Clark yeah. Gable is suave and debonair and had that, you know, yeah. that Clark that Gable look yeah. That whole thing going on. And, uh, oh, yeah, dashing, handsome guy. And, and uh, uh, in contrast, Marlon Brando was just – a badass. He was a bad motherfucker. He was a bad motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, I, I just think she reacted negatively to that, that testosterone. <laughs> Some women do. What you know. about Bronson? Uh, Bronson's another one of these guys. He was jacked. He was yeah. jacked. He's one of those guys. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was a boxer. Yeah. He was a good boxer. But he had those long bicep insertions, mm-hmm. had veiny forearms. And he swaggered, and he pulled it off. And uh, he was uh, – uh, I, I know a guy that worked with him a long time ago. Oh, really? And, yeah. And uh, and Bronson was kind of a prick, you know. Yeah. Is you know, some of those guys can be. Yeah. But he was – what a what a physique on a guy that was not a – you know, and everybody assumed that he trained. Yeah, right. I, don't, That's a, I don't know. I don't know that he did. We don't know that he did, right? No, you don't yeah, know that he that, did. That's an important consideration. Every once in a while, a guy yeah. like that just falls out of the womb, and he's standing around yeah. at eight percent body fat. Mm-hmm. You know, cool. with perfect arm. Yeah. You know, you don't know that he. You trained. don't know that they trained. He just he just looks like he trained. Sometimes <laughs> people look like they train when they this don't. This happens. Train. There are guys. It does yeah. happen. God Almighty! There were football players here here in Wichita. I was Falls. about to say, yeah, baseline deadlift. Who, who's baseline four oh five deadlifter yeah. without even without even that looked like a contest powerlifter. Yeah, guys with so much natural muscle mass and so much testosterone uh, that they got traps. Yeah, for no apparent reason. <laughs> you know, big stout boys. Yeah. That would run over your ass on the football oh, yeah. field, but didn't lift weights. Not really. You know. <laughs> they walk in four oh five you know, first day. Yeah, I know a guy who's baseline deadlift was four seventy five. Yeah, and uh, he was a minor league catcher at one point. Right. The time I met him, he owned a powerlifting gym. But I talked to him, and he said, "Yeah, when I walked in the weight room the first time, I pulled almost five hundred. Yeah, and he's you look at him, he's a big dude. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and yeah. He, you looked at him before he was training. Yeah, he would have looked yeah, like looked, a big. He was guy. a big guy. Yeah, baseline, just a big yeah. guy. Yeah, born that way. And, and that's the thing with these Hollywood workouts. They're like celebrity trainer made him do this. Right. Yeah, you know? <laughs> celebrity trainer. And it's like, him. no, no, he, no, he felt that's that's why he got hired to do the movie. Now you got a training, right? <laughs> it's kind of like well, the elite athlete. You are a lucky son of a gun because <laughs> you are going to train somebody that makes you look like you know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> it's kind of like the NFL. <laughs> Most assuredly, do not know what the hell you're doing. So let's take the thirty pound, thirty percent body fat guy. How do we make him lose weight? What do we do? How do we cut it? This guy is not a novice. He's an intermediate. All right. So number one is calorie restriction. That's never changed. We've known this for decades. So then you have to decide where you're going to pull those calories. First, protein needs to stay high. Why? Because we want to skew the weight loss towards body fat. And there's plenty of evidence, both what we've seen working with people, 
and the academics, everybody agrees on this. You have to keep protein high to keep muscle mass on. That's half the equation. The other half is you still have to train. Yeah. Yeah, you still have to train. Um, and we'll come back to that, you know, training discussion. We still got two other macronutrients to cover. So do you pull carbs or do you pull fat? Well, it's become fashionable to pull carbs because, you know, keto just sounds like a cool word. Right. Keto. Keto is cool. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulling pulling carbs is fashionable, but you know all mm-hmm. the people I talk to mm-hmm. that are training hard and losing body fat mm-hmm. do what you're about to tell us mm-hmm. to do. You pull fat, and the thing about pulling fat is you are hungry as hell all the time. Espe- all the time, especially in your, maybe in the beginning. If you're thirty percent body fat, getting down to twenty percent body fat, you're not gonna be too hungry, even if you pull fat. Once you start getting below 20% body fat, you get hungrier, and then you're ravenous if you're trying to get down to 10. But we're not trying to do that. So, right. But generally, if you got somebody who's really fat, you know, they don't feel it the first month or so. Mm-hmm. And this kind of goes back to a different point that I don't think that cuts beyond a three-month timeline are advantageous. Because, number one, you're dieting for too long. You're in an energy restriction for too long. It's going to interfere with training, and you run the risk of losing too much muscle mass. All the things you don't want to do. Right. So you typically want to have a nice, honest three-month fat loss period. And if you have more to lose, let's say you're going from 40% to 30 or 25%, you need a break. You want to go down to 18, take a month, maybe two, and then go at it again. This way right. you preserve the strength and the muscle and, mass. And then not do stupid things during the break. Yeah. Like, like birthday cake. Don't yeah. do not do that. No. But what is it you think, as a, as a nutritionist, what is it about – Dietary fat and satiety. Well, it's more satiating than carbs. Right. But but it's funny because carbs are more thermogenic than fat. Mm-hmm. So people try to confuse, people get those confused sometimes. So digesting and absorbing nutrients has a caloric cost to it. So they call that diet-induced thermogenesis or the thermic effect of food, depending on what you're reading. Protein has the highest. Carb will be next and fat will be the last because fat just easily converts into stored body fat. It's already in its... It's already a lipid. Yeah. It doesn't have to be converted into anything. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a high energy cost. Um, But satiety is a different story. So protein tends to be the most satiating in terms Mm -hmm. of keeping you full. Fat would be the next one and carb would be the last one. So anybody who's eaten an entire box of cereal for whatever reason uh, (laughs) finds that they can eat a second box of cereal. (laughs) Oh, God, Raisin Bran. I just right. have to stay away from that. Can't have that in the house. No, you can't have it in the yeah. house because mm-hmm. four bowls of Raisin Bran. Mm-hmm. Where's that other? Are we out of milk? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I will crush a box of cold cereal. Oh, yeah, yeah it's oh, yeah. easy as hell to do, yeah. God. Because it's just yeah. sugar. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'll keep going. And, yeah. uh, you know, once you add protein to the mix or fat, you know, get a little bit fuller so Mm -hmm. let's go back to the guy who's cutting his fat's probably 50 60 grams of fat he's gonna be hungry yeah on keto 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 (laughs) o'rourke keto is not gonna be hungry no but he's gonna that's the that is the primary report from everybody doing low carb High protein, high fat. is It's the easiest damn diet in the world to stay on because you just don't get hungry because your blood sugar mm-hmm. is not swinging around. And do mm-hmm. you think that's the primary? You think that's the primary mechanism behind it? You get your blood sugar down to 80 and it just stays there all the time? And there's, is is swinging around blood sugar what causes? That could contribute. This, I think this, the... This, this sensation of being starving to death the biggest thing is breaking down and digesting protein requires a lot more work um in the intestines than breaking down carbs or breaking down fats mm-hmm. you have to denature them and break mm-hmm. them up into amino acids it's you know more of a pain in the ass right so, you got to reassemble and, them into yeah into what the amino acid profile you need mm-hmm. and all this other stuff yeah so it's just a lot of uh, yeah a lot of chemistry going on exactly exactly and um with carbs not so much <laughs> So mm-hmm. you tend to be more satisfied that way. And then it also slows down the uh, digestion and absorption of carbs if you're having them with protein. So these, you know, insulin people out there, uh, you know, say, oh, carbs are the devil because you're going to get your insulin up and it's going to just get you fat. Um, I'm not saying that you should, you know, go eat Skittles all day or drink Kool-Aid, mm-hmm. but um, not all carbs are bad. And 
eating carbs by themselves are a different physiological response than eating carbs with In combination with, with another with protein with or protein. fat or protein and or and fat, fat but especially protein um it slows the digestion and then fiber that's why yeah. ice cream's got a low glycemic index exactly because there's fat and there's a little bit of protein mm-hmm. but if you eat uh if you drink kool-aid it's going to have a higher one yeah, mm-hmm. it's gonna shoot right up so i don't think anybody's ever advised just having a carb only diet or having carb only meals you talk to any nutritionist they're going to say have your fruits your vegetables your whole grains and your you know protein source Mm. um and if you do that you're on a mixed diet if you're on a mixed diet you're not going to have crazy swings in blood glucose and insulin right yeah so well when you do a cut though with Mm -hmm. a hamburger Mm -hmm. or the tried and true chicken breast and Mm -hmm. and white rice I don't know how anybody does that for more than about an hour. That's <laughs> you've done it before. You <laughs> talk. How was I, it? I can't. Oh, it's, it's just, you can't imagine how. Well, they know. Yeah, they've tried it too. They've all tried it. It's just not any fun. No. But why do you get cravings? Because the rice goes in blood mm-hmm. sugar. Mm-hmm. I, what I'm what I'm interested in yeah. is what's the mechanism behind starving to death. The perception that even though you've eaten four thousand calories today, you're hungry. Well, do, do they know? I don't know if they know. There's several different. Like I've already talked about one. Another reason right. is um, when you're thinking about macronutrient partitioning. When you're talking about that, uh, carbs trigger elicit a different response than fat when you overfeed them. So when you eat more carbs. You burn more carbs. This has been measured and observed. When right. you eat, when you eat more fat, nothing happens to your fat oxidation. Right, it stays flat. And if you keep going, the proportion of those calories stored as fat increase. So the short of that is, you eat more carbs, you burn more carbs. You eat more fat, you store more fat. So put this into context: how does the typical American will eat a high carb, high fat diet? So just think about what I just said. Worst of both worlds. You're burning more carbs, and you're mm-hmm. burning less fat mm-hmm. because you're burning more carbs, which means you're storing more fat. Right. So the, that's the fat. And yeah. blood sugar is swinging yeah. around. It's swinging around, yeah, which means insulin swinging around. Insulin right. can lead to fat deposits, but insulin's also anabolic, which people tend to ignore. Right. So it just depends on how you're looking at it. If you're on a high-fat diet and a high-carb diet, that insulin's going to allow those extra fat calories to get deposited as body fat a lot faster. But if you're on a moderate fat diet or low fat diet, um, you have to have fat to deposit for insulin to do that. That's what people. That's the part people mm-hmm. miss. They're just like insulin, body fat. It's like well, you have to be ingesting enough fat mm-hmm. for it to be deposited. Right. So if you're eating a bunch of pizza, you're eating two pizzas a day and drinking a gallon of milk, you know. <laughs> Which is what you said to do. Yes, yeah, which is yeah. what I tell everybody yeah, to do. Cheetos, too. Yeah, Cheetos and yeah. maybe another gallon of milk. Three everybody. gallons. Yeah. Everybody. Nobody should ever lose weight. No. So let's you know, kind of stay on this topic here. So low-fat diet, high protein. So you still have enough carbs to you know, at least get by in your training. Mm-hmm. You're probably still going to lose weight off the bar because leverage is going to change. Yes. So that doesn't mean you're losing muscle mass. You're going to lose some muscle mass because you're in a catabolic environment. But by manipulating your macronutrients in the way we just described, you're skewing that. You're trying to skew that down. You're bending right. the curve. You're minimizing it. But you might lift less weight because leverage has changed. Mm-hmm. Your abdominal circumference has shrunk. That helps you squat more. That helps you bench more. A big gut. Yeah. It does. So if you've gotten strong as a fat guy... You're going to have to re-get strong as a not-fat guy once you lose all the weight. That's pretty common. Mm-hmm. And the interest, the interesting thing about it goes back to what we said earlier. Once you start refeeding those calories, the weight on the bar starts going back up. So it's a temporary situation. Um, when you rebound back up, you end up getting stronger to lower body weight, which is, you know, what ha- I wasn't a real fat guy, but, you know, I got down probably too lean. But as soon as I started eating, weight started to come back on on the bar and uh specifically it was the carbohydrates so the thing about it is when you're lifting weights it's considered an anaerobic activity you can't really burn fat in an anaerobic activity and you know i've written about this and uh 
you know, the specifics of that you can find in my articles. I'm not going to do a biochemistry lesson here, but, um, you need carbs and, you know, the first line of defense when you're lifting a heavy weight is you're going to first use creatine that goes quick. And then you start breaking down your body's stored glycogen, which is the carbohydrate you store in your muscle and your liver, but the liver wipes out pretty fast. So you're using mostly muscle glycogen to fuel a lot of your workouts, and each set you break down a little more. And let's also not forget, your nerves use up glucose. And what are we using when we lift heavy? There's a, right. there's a CNS response. So your nerves need the <clears throat> glucose. Your muscles and, need the glucose. And your brain is and, the number and your one brain, user yeah. of of carb during the day 130 grams approximately so 60 grams of carb probably not sustainable not yeah. easily no. No, no you're gonna have to make carbs out of something else yeah yeah you know? out of protein usually amino acids right protein's yeah. easier than making it out of fat yeah which is disappointing i know i know but nonetheless it is so so if we're gonna if we're gonna diet this guy down mm -hmm. and we understand some of the chemistry now what are we going to feed him? If you're riding a diet for a guy mm -hmm. that's 30% body fat, that needs to drop to 20, mm -hmm. what does his meal plan look like during the day? What does he eat? What do you want him, what do, you want him to, to do? You want him to have probably 250 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. And you probably want him to have 400 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. Usually it ends up getting lower, but yeah. Let's sure. say 350. Yeah, 300. 300 grams of carbs. Yeah. Yeah. How much fat do you want him to have? Probably 50 or 60 grams. Now, what does that look like on the plate? So now we're not eating whole eggs anymore. We're eating egg whites. Ugh. And there's ways to make them less not appetizing. Right, less, less not less appetizing. Less nauseating. Less nauseating. I think we talked about this in the last podcast. I, 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 Stan and I talked about it on ours. It's yeah. just it's, yeah. we're, we're in agreement that egg whites are just prison food. I, I've had tricks that I've used to make it more tolerable. Number one is ketchup. Ketchup. <laughs> you put ketchup on them. There's, there's make, a bunch of carbs. Ketchup. ketchup. Make, ketchup. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Well, you have 300 to play with. Ketchup and Tabasco sauce, right? Yeah. Tabasco sauce is good, pepper, and then you mix a bunch right. of vegetables in there. There's ways to manipulate it, but this is, again, this is an ideal situation. You're going right. to tailor this to the person, but if you want a general layout, so he's going to have egg whites. He's going to probably put vegetables in it to get some fiber, maybe some ketchup to add some flavor to it. And then he's probably going to have some berries, you know, more fiber, and then there's his carbs for the morning. He's going to take an intra-workout carb shake because now he's not getting enough carbs. Right. As if, if versus when he was in a surplus. So he's got to drink him during his workout because he's probably going to use up some blood glucose because mm -hmm, he's sure. restricted. And this may not happen at 300. It may happen at, at 250, you know. It just depends, you know. So he's going to start having to take carbs during his workout. I don't think this is as important if you're eating enough calories, but I think it becomes important when you're not eating enough calories. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I I, I completely agree that if you uh, if you are trying to train hard on even anything bordering on a low carb diet, you, it, mm. it you just can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it. You haven't got any gas. Yeah, really. Furthermore, you stay sore all yeah. the damn time. Yeah, too. yeah. Um. Even in the presence of a bunch of protein, if you're not yeah. taking in enough carbs, you just can't heal up. Right. And you, that inflammatory response won't go away. Mm -hmm. um, some other choices. The thing that I like the most when I cut, so I eat red meat every day. Um, and by red meat, I get the 96% lean ground beef because that's a hell of a lot better than that awful, awful, awful boneless, skinless chicken breast. No, I'm not eating the shit. I, I ain't eating that shit either. I'm not going to eat I've it. Never had to, I never had to do chicken and broccoli on a cut. I've always had the extra lean ground beef. That's what I go for. For See, to yeah. me, the mm -hmm. best 80-20 ground beef is where I want to eat my hamburger meat. Yeah. 75 is too greasy. 80-20 mm -hmm. is the best flavor. And I think that's fine on maintenance calories. Right. But we're trying to cut, and we only have 60 grams of plate. Right. With. No, you're right. You have a math problem. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And, it, again, temporary situation. Yeah. Ben, it's, it, any, yeah. any percentage is better than chicken breast. Oh, God. Or that god-awful so, turkey. Somehow. Oh, Stan said the same thing. 
Yeah. I, yeah. I like Stan. Stan said exactly the same yeah. thing. Stan said he's just not going to eat the shit. Yeah, I'm not either. You know, it's, it's not going to do it, you know, um, and it's not necessary to no. do that. Um, somehow in the last 30 years, I think probably with the low fat craze of the 80s, the one thing that has stuck ever since is that white meat is leaner than dark meat or red meat. White meat is just so much better than red meat across the board. I, yeah, right? that's just propaganda. That's yeah. just, I don't know where that came yeah. from. You know, yeah. like pork calling itself the other white meat. I think it's racist. It is racist. What I think yep. it is. And uh, said that. I, I don't think there's any magic about the color of the meat. No. I think that, I think that uh, what gets called red meat is mm-hmm. more nutritionally dense mm-hmm. than what gets called white meat. Yeah. It's racism. Yes. Yeah, it, it's clearly. totally racism. Clearly. So, uh, God, have you ever seen elk meat? Yeah. You ever had elk? It's good. That's the best. It's oh, delicious. God, oh, God, it's man. delicious. It's had it in I've Washington. Had, I was in, we were in, in Alaska mm-hmm. a long time ago mm-hmm. at Will Morris's place, and he scored us some moose meat. Oh, man. Oh, and I, we fried it in the pan, salt and pepper, oh, man. little Getting bacon hungry, fat, yeah. and it was medium rare and it was so good yeah oh god almighty it was better than elk huh. it was delicious that was i remember that so well yeah. god it was good and you just you know we don't see it down here but but uh uh those kind of red meat mm-hmm. are just you know i've had horse meat in mm-hmm. iceland it was good it tastes like elk yeah it tastes quite a bit like elk I w- I think I had it once somewhere. Um, you probably had it <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I won't say where. <laughs> but no, I uh, bet you've had it. Uh, you've traveled around, and yeah. they don't serve it here. It's not in the food chain here, yeah. but it's uh, in countries where there's no tab. For some reason, it's taboo. We don't eat horse meat. What, in the what do you States. do with the carcass? <laughs> it goes to waste. Or That's it, perfectly it, good meat. I mean, this is a complete and total aside. The... Horse meat market mm-hmm. at one time, uh, and I don't know why I'm out been out of the horse business a while now. But the at one time it, it was an important component of the of the the horse market in general because it set the bottom price mm-hmm. for the worth of an animal. If if the thing is, if you can always send a, a lame horse. Or a useless horse, or a vicious horse, or some other horse that was not usable. Mm-hmm. You could always sell that horse to the killers, and make six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars on the thing. Then it was a valuable animal in mm-hmm. terms of it was some value to it to keep it alive. Right. But if you eliminate the horse meat market, mm-hmm. you make it illegal to kill horses for meat, like was done for a while. Mm-hmm. Then what happens to those animals that have no other value? They'd, bad things, yeah. man. Bad things. You know, sorry people quit feeding them. They just turn them out on pasture. They're 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 not regarded as as valuable. If you've got uh, the a guy that's uh, that's rounding up killer horses, yeah. Uh, this is gonna make. The fourteen year old girls cry. The vengeance. You, you got a guy that's rounding up killer horses. He's gonna take a trailer load of horses to the horse killers. Yeah, and they buy them. He's bought those things from people that that he knows they can't use the horses. Mm-hmm. He the horse retains value, mm-hmm. and they're taken care of. Mm-hmm. They're fed. They're watered. They're cared for until they leave. Mm-hmm. Right, and he feeds them and he waters them because it is. Not profitable to him to show up at the killers with a with a bunch of grade C carcasses. Right. Because they're just they're not of any they don't pay for those. No. So the whole idea that horse killers are bad for horses mm-hmm. is just short sighted city person bullshit. <laughs> you people in Brooklyn. <laughs> so yeah. There, there are there are things outside your walls that you don't know, okay. So, what is at it? any rate, horse meat in the United States is taboo. It's just a cultural thing. We don't eat it here. They eat it in parts of Europe, mm-hmm. and I've had it in Iceland, and it was good. Mm-hmm. It was good. 
and they love their horses over here just exactly like we love our horses here, but they're more practical about lots and lots of things. And uh, so anyway, that's yeah. an aside from the red meat discussion. So, so yeah. back to the back to the idea. What's a plate look like? So one of my favorite things to have. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, so I said I like ground beef. I like extra lean ground beef when I'm trying to lose weight. Mm-hmm. And I'll mix that in with some whole wheat pasta. Throw some pasta sauce on it. Mix in some vegetables. So that's that's an example of a dinner that I would have. And it just right. popped up another thought. So I have a. So gym, what would that? Do? What's the macros in that? What does that look like? It's probably about four or five hundred calories, maybe six. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're going to get a good seven to twelve grams of fiber there, probably right. about thirty grams of protein, maybe forty, and about fifty carbs. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's just your first plate, though. Well, that's my last plate. I skipped lunch. My first plate. My first plate was the egg whites, the vegetables. No, so, I mean uh, at that meal. At that meal, you're yeah. only going to eat one of those. Of course. Well, I'm buck eighty five. You're uh, the no. guy. Okay, we're talking about the guy who's two thirty. Yeah. He's going to probably have seventy carbs. Right. In that plate, he's probably going to have 50. eighty grams yeah. of protein. Yeah. Yeah. If he's eating three square three squares a day, yeah, yeah. that would make sense. Um, the general layout that I've kind of come up with is. You typically want your lean protein portion, which is going to range anywhere from 30 to 80 grams of protein, depending on how many meals you're having a day, your body size, etc. You're going to have your vegetables. You're going to have um, a carb source that's typically a complex carbohydrate or a fruit. And uh, you might have some dairy in there. And that kind of covers all the food groups. And it should result in a pretty low-fat meal. And then you have three to five of those a day. Mm-hmm. And if you do that seven days a week, not just Monday through Friday, right. you'll lose body weight every week. The problem is the seven days a week part tends to be where people get hung up. And they'll say, oh, I did this diet and I just can't lose weight. And then, you know, I start having them take What did you do me. Saturday? Oh, I went, well, out, I only, yeah. well, I went out, had a burger, french fries, uh, three beers, a glass of wine. Then I went home, had a pour of whiskey, went to bed. Oh, and by the way, I had some chocolate cake too, with some ice cream, a la mode. With some ice cream, yeah. yeah. So, and I did that like Saturday and Sunday. Oh yeah, right. And uh, this is why I've moved my nutrition approach towards photographs. So we all know that self-reported uh, food intake is bullshit. Mm-hmm. If, if they're writing it down, it's bullshit. So, yes. Yes, that's been yeah. studied a yeah. hundred times. Yeah. yeah. Self-reported, which makes all the more weird most of nutrition science which is done on the basis of self-reported food intake yeah it's yeah it's laughable it it is yeah and they know it it, they they know it is and they keep we have 30 years of nutrition recommendations based on what people say they eat and we have at the same time 30 years of studies demonstrating conclusively that when people say they eat this, they're lying about it. <laughs> the and, same. Oh uh, yeah. That's, so, and so yeah, we're lame. still they're still doing it. They're still being, doing it. Well, studies show. <laughs> studies don't show shit, <laughs> except that the studies don't show shit. And then, you know, <laughs> that's what studies show. There was one biostatistician. I saw him talk two years ago. His name was uh, David Allison, and he was going over self-reported physical activity and self-reported dietary intake. And his concluding statement, which ended up being the name of one of his papers, I loved it. He was like, right here, what we have is an example of, and he's showing the NHANES data, for those of you who know what that is, an example of when something is not better than nothing. <laughs> he's like, until we have a better way of, to measure it, we shouldn't even bother with this. <laughs> Don't bother doing the study. I subscribe to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, uh, you know, I was working on uh, developing a nutrition system, and I had an intern, and I had uh, two dietitians arguing with each other about which questionnaire we were supposed to use. In other words, which questionnaire the people were going to lie on. Yeah, so I I was being practical, and I said, let's use a 24-hour recall because it's the least burdensome, and it's just as false as the other three. <laughs> So why make them do it seven? It's just as yeah. bad. Just as, why make them log seven days? But it, yeah. If I want bullshit, give me the easiest to put together bullshit. Right. <laughs> and then I get this intern. She goes on, leaves one sentence, and says, 
well, how about we take pictures? And I said, well, that's a brilliant idea. And then I took it a step further. What if I just coach them on photographs of their food? And then I started doing this, and I learned real fast. I'm like, everything we thought these people are eating is precisely what they're eating. You know, there's cookies slipping in there every day. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, big meals out on the weekends. Right. There's three or four beers that are this high. So you just had them take pictures of everything that went in their mouth. People are more honest with their they, camera phone. They just pull out the phone, yeah. shoot it, yep. and then eat it. Yep. And just hand you the photographs. Yeah. You do the calculations. Yep. And that way you've got data. That's right. Fascinating. Yeah. And, Fascinating. you know, I'm sure there's stuff that's not on there, but it's as honest as we're going to get. And, right. And they're showing me the junk. So I have right. a, I feel more confident and, about know, what they're doing. If they're going to show you the beer and the cookies and yeah. shit like that, they're probably it's close. telling you close to the truth. Yeah. And they probably forgot right. that handful of M&Ms they took off their bosses. Yeah, yeah, it's but like the, shit like that, you know. But Yeah, but that's not. You yeah. got most of it. Yeah, you got most of it. And um, they do eat a stereotypical American diet. Mm -hmm. I know you're watching. People I work with, I'm <laughs> sorry. I won't name you. <laughs> but, but you know who you are. <laughs> yeah. I love all of you. But Well, of course. Yeah. But that, that that's what you see. You'll see a right. cookie on Monday, ice cream bar on Tuesday, and not the low-fat diet kind. You right. know, scoop of ice cream on Wednesday, nothing Thursday and Friday, then hamburger, french fries, wine, beer, whiskey, pizza, you know, whole egg omelet with a bunch of, you know, chorizo in it maybe southwestern style <laughs> 800 calorie omelet yeah but that's good for somebody who probably needs two thousand for two thousand calorie need female right you know? eating 800 of it in an omelet yeah so i mean i've seen it now i can say i've seen it because if, if they self-report you know will will morris told me this you know he's a physical therapist and he'll get some basic diet information from the patient right and i'll be like oh i eat chicken broccoli white rice and you know Fruit and salad, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, like I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like me. If, if you ask him to verbalize it or write it, you're going to get a dietician's dream. Right, right. If you ask him to take a picture of it, you're like, oh, well, that's an American diet. <laughs> yeah. Of I course. Mean, you know what? What boggles, yeah, but, yeah. What, what boggles me, Rip, right. is how has nobody – well, I, have, I know why. The real study to do is why don't we look at what's selling at grocery stores and restaurants? Mm -hmm. They'll find out a lot better data than something somebody's telling you they ate. Look in the shopping cart, checking out in front of you. <laughs> What's selling? What are these people buying? Mm -hmm. There's a case of real Cokes mm -hmm. in there, donuts, pre-made pancakes. Can you imagine somebody pre-making a pan, eating a pre-made pancake? <laughs> How easy is it to make a pancake? But no, you got to buy them at the store in a box. Mm -hmm. Oh God! But they're worried. And, they're worried you know, about asking. all <laughs> kinds of just a shopping cart. You know, forty pounds of carbs <laughs> in the shopping cart, and about fifty, and fat. not brown rice either. You know, and forty pounds of fat along with it. Yeah, because <laughs> it's all the carbs. That's what right. they love to say. It's all right. the carbs. Then you look at it. It's pizza, donuts, yeah. hamburgers, French fries, high carb, high fat. Right. But it's all carbs. Like, oh, I just ate so many carbs, and that's why I got fat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I'm like, no. The, oh, so I, no, I call it. more to it than that. I call fat the undercover macro because you can't visually see it. So right. the perception these people have is, oh, I just ate a bunch of carbs. Because a donut, you can see the bread. You can see the sugar. But you're not seeing the, you know, oil they deep fried it in. So the perception is I eat a lot of carbs. Donuts. I don't see them. Do you like donuts? No. No, I don't. I haven't had a donut in probably. Now, I had a bite of a donut mm -hmm. at Horn's Place. We got the Horn's Place. Oh, California's got good donuts, and his, <laughs> ironically. I and donuts his so mom, God. his, I can't stand them. I, I really don't like donuts. I don't, I, I haven't had one. I haven't had a donut in probably, probably 40 years, honestly. I oh, hate shit. them. I can't stand the idea of them. They're Horn just, broke your streak. And Horn's mom brought a bunch of donuts, and she makes these damn things. And it's just, you know, several boxes. These, I mean, they're beautiful. They smell yeah. good. Okay. Right? So I thought, I'll have a bite of one. 
and I had a bite of a donut. Mm-hmm. And I, that was enough. That was enough. I just don't <laughs> like them. I don't like the damn things. I'm not, I have no trouble staying yeah. away from sweet stuff. I really don't. Yeah. You know, I just don't have a sweet tooth. So, but, you know, cake, pie. Cake. I, for, for pie, I like, I really like tart cherry pie. I like that. Cherry like pie is pe- delicious. I like pecan pie. Good pecan pie at Thanksgiving is so hard to stay the hell out of. And pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. So, every, you know, like once a year I'll eat some stuff like that. But that's it. Yeah. I, I don't normally eat it because I don't even think about buying it. I don't have it in the house. So how do you get fat, Ripito? How do you get fat? Oh, I just, you know, it's a gallon of milk a day. Yeah. With the cake a day. It's the cake a day. Gallon of milk a day I eat. <laughs> I'm known for a gallon of milk. So it's yeah. a gallon of milk a yeah. day that That's I drink. That's the o- official That response. makes me fat. And I've only had like a half gallon today. Uh, I haven't had any. What I think I'm going to do is take a quart of milk <laughs> and pour a pint of half and half into that and just yeah. call that the other half gallon. There you go. You think it's – that's what I'll do. It's efficient. It's efficiency. Yeah. It saves time. Easier on the gut. <laughs> who, who cares that it's lower in protein? It's, it's still milk. It doesn't matter. It's milk. Yeah, yeah. you got to drink a gallon a day. Organic. 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 Don't you love how, you know, these people that send me these pictures, all this shit that they eat, yeah. they'll, they'll tell you, oh, I don't need aspartame. <laughs> yeah, they're all con- yeah. they're all concerned about yeah. it. And I'm not insulting any one person. I'm, you know, oh no, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Artificial yeah. sweeteners. Why yeah, those yeah, those yeah. turn to formaldehyde? Yeah, you know they'll yeah. they'll they'll preserve yeah. your intestines because yeah. they turn to formaldehyde. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay, Robert. Thanks for being here, man. We'll yeah. do this again, and just try to remember we got to talk about training next time. Instead of just babbling at each other. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, thank you for being here. See you next time. Bye.